uh, by first and foremost, uh, first and foremost, welcoming everyone and long, greetings to Lompo and welcome everyone to the Diamond Stream once again for the Vasa 2024. It is uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Lompo Kalia Novak with us um, at, on, on this platform. And uh, Lompo, as you can see, there are many, of, many friends, many disciples from all over the world. They're all here greeting you. So with palms in Anjali. Okay, we shall now uh, formally uh, uh, pay respects to you um, with three bows. First bow. Second bow. And third bow. May we please invite Long Po to start the session by leading us in a short guided meditation, Long Po. Sure, yeah. Blessings to everybody. So we'll begin with some uh, quiet meditation. <clears throat> Please find a comfortable posture, whether you're on a chair or the floor. <clears throat> Your number one aim is just to sit still for the next 15 minutes. <clears throat> Try not to move. I'm sure you've all done some meditation before uh, and you'll be familiar with the idea that it's something you train in or practice regularly to get the best results. It's not something you just do once. So in that respect, it's a bit similar to any kind of physical training, exercise, routine that you might do. Nowadays, everybody does different kinds of exercise like Tai Chi or jogging or go to the gym. And you'll tend to do it repeatedly, often doing the same exercises uh, each time. <coughs> My teacher, Ajahn Chah, used to say, with, it's the same with training this mind in meditation. We need to do it often, regularly. But the one big difference is we're training the mind to become still. Whereas when you're training the body with exercise, you move around to help uh, loosen up the joints and the muscles and work off some fat maybe. But with meditation, we're practicing mental exercise. And that's actually bringing the mind's energy, thoughts, perceptions, feelings, all the mental activity down to one place so that it's more under our control. So for that purpose, we usually have a meditation object that we put our attention on. So today I'll mention the breathing or the breath as the object. It's much the same with any other meditation technique or object that you use. Your aim is to pay attention or know the object. Keep it in mind by knowing it from moment to moment to moment. And this has a, an effect on the mind that it doesn't it's not aimed to make you fall asleep or go into a trance. It's aiming you just to know one single thing, in this case, the breath. Because normally, as you've probably observed already, our mind knows many things moment after moment, many different thoughts, feelings, sensations, we tend to have this experience of the mind running around or moving around from <coughs> thought to thought, feeling to feeling, mood to mood, which can be quite mentally exhausting, confusing, and difficult for us in various ways, quite stressful sometimes. Whereas the point of meditating on the breathing is to bring attention just to one place. 
and from that you'll find your mind actually calms down the more that you're mindful or aware of the breathing the less your mind is running around the more you start to experience calm and stillness so in that sense training the mind is a bit <coughs> different from training the body but it's still something you need to practice work with regularly if you're brand new to the meditation you also need to find a place in your body where you're going to put your attention over and over again so Ajahn Chah, my teacher, used to say, well, take a few deep breaths to begin. Breathe in. Find that feeling at the tip of your nostrils first as the air rushes in. So you can take an exaggerated long breath to start with to help you find that feeling. Because it's a very subtle feeling and if you are used to thinking and talking and doing things all day your mind will find it a little challenging to find the feeling and be with that feeling or sensation of the breathing so breathe in a bit longer and deeper than usual so you really feel the sensation of air coming in at the tip of your nostrils and observe the air going downwards into your lungs so your lungs fill up they expand and then the third point is the rising of your abdomen with that in breath it rises up the area below your lungs And then there's a pause at the end of the in-breath. You have to be careful because your mind likes to fill, fill in the blanks. So in that pause it will start thinking maybe about other things. So you have to hold attention even through the pause, however short, brief it is. And then do the whole process backwards so now you notice the abdomen falling with the out breath and the lungs deflate shrink back and then the air from inside the body comes out of the nostrils back into the atmosphere Obviously, this is a vital biological process for, the, for life, for this body that we breathe in and breathe out. <coughs> but unless there's an, a problem with your breath, like when you have a cold or something, you tend not to notice the breath because it's so subtle. So that's why you need to take a few deep breaths at the beginning of the meditation to help you find this feeling and that in itself tends to calm you down because it brings all your attention to your body as you're sitting right here right now you know we use this phrase brings your attention to the present moment you're knowing your body and your mind and the breath in the present moment because that's what you're paying attention to or that's what you're knowing and as you do this you'll notice you can know the in breath at the beginning you establish a tension there you want to know the breath you want to put your mind on the breath but already in the middle of your in breath or before the out breath is finished you're thinking about other things and the whole object of mind has changed thoughts images 
memories, sensations, sounds, all kinds of things can quickly distract you. So this is why we have to train or practice developing the ability to know one thing, the in-breath and the out-breath. And what will help also is to refine your awareness or this quality of knowing down just to one spot, one location. So having followed the breath in, watching the lungs expand, the abdomen rise, the abdomen fall, the lungs deflate, the breath going out, you pick one spot just to focus on I would suggest the tip of your nostrils to start with, but the other places like the center of your chest or the abdomen are okay if you prefer. <coughs> but now you pick your one spot and you keep returning attention, your mind's awareness to this one spot over and over again. Just like a carpenter with a saw, a hand saw sawing down on a piece of wood. Although there's movement, the saw going back and forth, there's only contact at one point where the wood and the blade of the saw meet. That's why he can cut the saw, cut the wood. Similarly, you're aiming just to know one point in the body, one point of contact where the breath is coming in and out. And keep returning to know that over and over again. Some people will also recite a word to help. So they would, Ajahn Chah said you can recite the word Buddha from Buddha, which means Puru, or the one who knows, the knowing. Some people like to count one until ten, back to, and then start at one again after reaching ten. <coughs> Some people just like the silence, but you have to be very careful because your thoughts like to fill in the silence and take your attention away from the breath. Especially in the beginning, the breath can be so subtle, it's hard to find, or it can be boring as an object. And also the power of karma. We like to think about many things. We react to many things. So if the breath is not very stimulating, we sometimes find we are bored and then even sleepy. Sometimes we're restless because we've accumulated worries and concerns about other aspects of life. All of these impinge on our awareness and they want the mind away to think about other stuff or react in one way or another, or just to fall into drowsiness, dullness. So your main task is to keep alert, to take some effort, and to keep knowing the in-breath and out-breath as much as you can, as consistently as you can. But neither force it, so you, if you force it, you'll become tense neither being so relaxed that you just fall asleep or lose interest. You have to learn how to have the right amount of effort for you, for what you need at this time. So for the last few minutes of this meditation, I'll stay quiet and you can Continue to put attention on your breathing. Try not to lose this quality of knowing. 
So if you do find you've lost it, bring your mind back to the breath as quickly as you can. Hello, brothers and sisters. Let us now request a Dhamma talk from Long Pok. Soka <coughs> Kap. <coughs> Rakma Chaloka Hipati Sahampati Kata Jali A Diwara Aya Chatha Santi Dasata Paraja Kajatika Dese Tu Dhamma Anukam Pimang Pajang Namu eta saba kawata wara hato sama zambuta sa. Namu eta saba kawata wara hato sama zambuta sa. Namu eta saba kawata wara hato sama zambuta sa. Putang tamang sankang namasami. Blessings, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. <laughs> Something that people regularly ask for advice about in the monastery is how to deal with the 
fast changing pace of life, technology, society, even climate with climate change, there's often changes and new things we have to experience that maybe haven't, we're not used to. Even here, we just had a hot spell or a heat wave in the middle of winter. We're still in winter in Melbourne. And we've had summer temperatures and now we're paying for it. We've got a thunderstorm going on outside. <laughs> But actually change is nothing new. And you're probably aware the Buddha's first teaching, or first formal teaching, the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta ended with the students, Venerable Kondanya, they say open, opening the Dhamma eye, gaining insight into the transient nature or the changing nature of phenomena physical phenomena, the body, the material world, and mental phenomena, the mind, mental activity, thoughts, feelings, memories. He had a clear insight which helped him to separate between, you might say, the thinking mind which likes to create and label and form views and opinions about everything and react to everything with uh, liking and disliking, and the material world, which is just is that is is as it is, mm. made up of different material elements, which are just earth, air, fire, and water. By seeing change, he could also see through the way human beings we make this delusion or create this delusion of a solid self and from there we start to feel like we control everything and own everything and lots of suffering and stress ensues because of it. So he had a very clear insight that changed his whole way of looking at life, looking at himself, looking at the world around him. You might even say it was a kind of earth-shaking insight and he became what we call a stream entra or stream winner, sotapanna, meaning that that insight never left him afterwards. It only deepened as he continued his practice and eventually he became fully enlightened or reached Nibbana. So that insight stayed with him as a constant in a world that is not constant or a world that is always changing. And that's because his mind became kind of very close to the Dhamma, to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. You probably heard this famous uh, phrase, one who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha, one who knows the Dhamma knows the Buddha, one who knows the Buddha knows the Dhamma. Dhamma means just truth, the way things are. So the Buddha and the Dhamma are <coughs> the same thing. What does the Buddha realize? What does the Buddha become enlightened by? Well, it's the Dhamma, the truth, by uh, penetrating, having penetrating insight into the truth. And his central teachings we call the Four Noble Truths, the Arya Satcha Dhamma, explain about suffering and how to end suffering. But the Dhamma is the constant, it's just the way things are. And the Buddha's enlightenment was because of the Dhamma, he had penetrating insight into the truth of the way things are. And it's why, it's why the, Buddha, uh, the Dhamma is peaceful, it's because it's constant, it's just the way things are. And the reason we suffer and get, feel stressed and have problems in life is because we're not seeing or knowing the way things are. And we start creating fantasies and delusions and hiding from the truth, denying the truth, trying to cover over the truth. Sometimes we do it deliberately. Sometimes we do it just habitually without realizing. 
But that's the nature of the cause of our suffering is ignorance or just delusion and not understanding the way things are. We suffer because of it. But what makes a Buddha so special is he saw through that or saw what, what is the cause of suffering for a human being and went beyond it. And that's why we perhaps give so much value to the Buddha and his teachings. Right? When I was a young monk, I went to Thailand to live with Ajahn Chah. Stayed at Wat Nanachat, the International Forest Monastery, which is about eight kilometers from Ajahn Chah's monastery. And in those days, there was no cars available, no electricity. It was very simple, the forest and the life of a monk in the monastery. So if we wanted to see Ajahn Chah, we had to walk to see him. And we walked for a couple of hours to get to Wabapong, the monastery where he lived. And myself and I think most of the other monks or all the other monks were happy to do that from time to time because we believed Ajahn Chah was an enlightened disciple of the Buddha. We wanted to know and hear Dhamma from Ajahn Chah or at least meet him, uh, be in his presence. And we gave value to the what we call enlightenment or this knowledge that those who have practiced the Dhamma of the Buddha or realized the Dhamma of the Buddha have. It's been like that since the time of the Buddha. In the time of the Buddha, clearly there were no, there was not much technological development in northern India, certainly no cars or electricity, <coughs> electricity or anything. But people would walk sometimes for days to get to see the Buddha because the idea of somebody who has understood the truth and freed their mind from suffering was a huge thing. Maybe the biggest thing in, in the world, in people's lives at that time. Of course, if they've never met the Buddha or heard the Dhamma yet, it's just an idea, the idea that there are such people who are free from suffering and really know the way out of suffering, beyond suffering. It was something that people gave a great value to, importance to, were willing to walk and maybe even risk dangers because in those days you know, walking would mean walking through the jungle, there'd be wild animals, bandits, disease, uh, maybe food and drink could be scarce, all kinds of obstacles but they were willing to do that just to meet a Buddha. For some people just hearing the word that there is an enlightened Buddha who has realized this Dhamma, who has realized this teaching, just that thought brought them great joy. They'd hear, oh, there is an enlightened Buddha, where is he? And it might be close by, because in those days there's no internet, so they probably didn't get a lot of news about, about India and what was going on in other towns and areas, but maybe through uh, tra people traveling who had already met the Buddha, they pass through at your village and they say, oh, we met the Buddha, there's a Buddha, he's not that far away, he's here, he's there. And people would have joy arise in their hearts, just knowing, ah, there is someone who is enlightened, a fully awakened Buddha who knows the way out of suffering. So since the time of the Buddha, just the idea, the concept of enlightenment, awakening has aroused joy, happiness in people's hearts. And in our day and age, well, we don't have the Buddha, the living Buddha, but we still have the Dhamma, his teachings, and we have the Sangha. And enlightened teachers such as Ajahn Chah and others arouse often the same kind of joy. And of course, joy, happiness, when it arises in your heart, is a very energizing factor. And what you might call the joy of Dhamma is much better than just your more mundane, average kind of joy of you know, eating nice food, meeting friends, enjoying a movie, whatever, you know, what we call sensual pleasure. That kind of joy is 
real, true, but it doesn't last very long and it doesn't lead you to do that much maybe, especially nowadays because we have so much access to different kinds of pleasures. Um, but the kind of joy of Dhamma, you know, knowing that wise, peaceful teachers and people who can maybe show you the way out of suffering does lead on to a lot of effort and energy. It makes people willing to walk for days on end or hours on end or go through obstacles to get there. Um, even nowadays, I think many of you listening, uh, you may have been on journeys to meet with Dhamma teachers, to hear the Dhamma, to make offerings, to be in the presence of Dhamma teachers, maybe in other countries or many hours from where you live. So it has a very energizing effect on the mind and that leads on to action, what you call skillful action. It's one of the effects of the Dhamma. Of course, when you meet the teacher, just as in the time of the Buddha, people would go and they would meet the Buddha and maybe sit there and just bask in his presence <laughs> or make an offering if the, it was the right time to make an offering. You know, I imagine in those days they didn't have a lot of wealth most people you know sure the millionaires had some material wealth but the average person maybe could only offer a flower a candle something very small or some rice on on arms round or something but they would make their offering again as an expression of their joy their faith in the buddha and if they could, uh, they would do that with, with, again, with a belief, this is something really good, this is something valuable, important. I had that feeling to some extent maybe, maybe it's not the Buddha, but going to see Ajahn Chah just to sit in his presence when I first went to Thailand. Brought up this great sense of peace, joy and confidence. That, oh, enlightenment is still possible in this day and age. And if there was any way I, you can give some small act of service to Ajahn Chah, like when I first met Ajahn Chah, he was already ill. But sometimes there would be a chance you go and visit him and you could empty a trash can <laughs> or pick up something or give something to a monk looking after Ajahn Chah. Or in those days we used to have little fans and we'd... Um, use the fan to swipe away mosquitoes, not to kill them, but just to create air around Ajahn Chah so that a mosquito wouldn't land on him. Because later on I actually went and helped nurse him, sometimes 24 hours a day, just live with him, doing everything I could for him. But even just visiting Sangha and laity would do whatever smaller or greater act they could to express their joy and happiness and meeting the great teacher. That's something very rare in the world. You can't get that so much online or you know, secondhand. Online tends to be secondhand. I know it's often still useful like now to listen to Dhamma and discuss Dhamma, but there's also something you get in person when you meet teachers um, very similar to the time of the Buddha, I think. You get a sense of this is some living example of the good the goodness that humans can aspire to and attain. It's not just uh, a fantasy <coughs> or a vague hope, but actual reality of attaining purity of mind, you might say, a mind free from suffering, stress, and the causes, greed, anger, and delusion. It's sense of it's possible. Again, you might say that's an even greater form of uh, has a greater energizing effect on the mind. In one thing, just hearing it, there might be an enlightened teacher or the Buddha in the time of the Buddha or Sangha in later years. Just hearing of the presence of Sangha is one thing, but actually meeting them and being in their presence even more, it, it catalyzes many, many good qualities for the practitioner, the interested or the curious practitioner and this is even something you can sense or experience beyond words as well like 
Of course, the Dhamma we mainly know through talks and books, and we hear the Dhamma and read the Dhamma, and that is important and you might say vital, but it's also something you feel, isn't it? So like for me, when I first went to Thailand, I couldn't speak Thai, and Ajahn Chah wasn't talking either. So my first impression of Ajahn Chah was by feeling, and he was old and sick, so he didn't look that great, because he wasn't in the best of physical health, but the presence of mind and the feeling was something very tangible. And you know, not just me, but pretty much everyone around him agreed. And that includes people who've, who were not necessarily Buddhist or didn't know Ajahn Chah. So that includes people like my friends and family who came to visit me would sit, meet Ajahn Chah and also feel it and could just sit in his presence and immediately feel some kind of calm and peace that they didn't normally feel. And on and on you can go, you know, the number of stories and occasions when people just came into his presence crying maybe because they're so stressed and so unhappy and their tears sort of gradually faded. People were very angry, calmed down. People were very sad, kind of perked up a bit all kinds of amazing experiences, even wild animals from the forest coming to to be next to Ajahn Chah and being calmed by his presence. That's again another attractive quality of the Dhamma that brings us in and energizes the mind to look for goodness and want goodness and want that which is better than what we've experienced so far in life, you might say gives value to the Dhamma and the, and the way of practice. Because then that leads on to actually wanting to hear the Dhamma or read the Dhamma to get the actual instructions and details. And that's why even online, when you're more removed from teachers perhaps, when you have Dhamma online, it's still valuable because we need to share experience, answer questions, elaborate on the way of practice and give advice how to deal with obstacles and whatever. But the aim is always to come back to the truth, the way things are, the Dhamma, the way things are. So the best teachings tend to direct you back to yourself <laughs> rather than being an end in themselves. You know, the Dhamma, the Dhamma talk is good, but it's not so much an end in itself, it's really pointing you to practice for yourself or know for yourself. That's the aim of it. And sometimes yeah, it depends on what, where people are at. Sometimes, say for Ajahn Chah, sometimes when he was teaching, he could be very direct. Occasionally he could scold someone or criticize them. Sometimes he could be very smoothing. Sometimes he could use humor to relax people. Sometimes he could just explain things, but very clearly in easy to understand language. As probably you all know, you, you read his books now or you hear his translated talks. Um, he's often speaking in very down to earth practical terms, but in a way that helps you to understand something that maybe you didn't understand before or help deepen your understanding of something you partially understand. He was very good at that. So he had a whole range of ways of teaching and Perhaps that's again the value of the awakened mind is it's adaptable in the way compassion and wisdom is displayed that you know, can fit to different situations, different people. One thing Ajahn Chah used to say is that we suffer because we've abandoned or given up the Buddha. We've let go of the Buddha. And you could say at the same time, we've let go of the Dhamma. If we're ever stressed, we're ever suffering, you know, the mind is, is no longer thinking of the Buddha, no longer remembering the Dhamma that the Buddha taught. Therefore we suffer. Because if you, as soon as you bring your mind back to the Buddha and the Dhamma, you start to feel better. I'd say that's just a, a fact of life. You know, you don't have to be a Buddhist. You don't have to have any particular belief system or whatever. <coughs> Because the Dhamma is really just truth of the way things are. 
But whenever you come back to the Buddha and the Dhamma, you start, your life starts to improve straight away because in that moment you feel better and you have a bit of better understanding. And Ajahn Chah is famous for this, for getting people back to the Buddha and the Dhamma or seeing through where they are suffering and, and getting them to see in terms of Dhamma, whatever their particular problem was. So when Ajahn Chah began his monastery, it was back in the 1950s, he, he had to deal with a lot of uh, people who were not particularly Buddhist. I guess that, that hasn't changed today. There's still a lot of people coming to monasteries and temples who are not particularly Buddhist. When I say not particularly Buddhist, it means they have lots of different opinions and views and beliefs which are not necessarily in line with Dhamma. And that was no different from Ajahn Chah. But some people have this sort of misty-eyed view, oh, Ajahn Chah living in Thailand, Buddhist country, it's probably all easy for him, he got enlightened because you know, everyone was Buddhist and all the conditions were supportive. But I'm not sure that was really true. You know, most of the villagers had a lot of superstition, beliefs that say if you're in Singapore or any kind of modern urban environment, you probably would find quite strange or unusual or at least distant from what you believe in. There's a lot of superstition, animist beliefs, beliefs in ghosts and spirits, and a lot of what you would just call wrong view around. And that was often expressed in the behavior. There was a lot of unruly, uh, what nowadays we'd call criminal behavior in the local neighborhood, in the local area. And Ajahn Chah is famous for you might say taming people with very wrong views and hard views and destructive views, taming them, calming them down and getting them to see the way of practice of the Dhamma. And a lot of people were very grateful for that at that time. And probably many, many, most of his original students are dead now, but <coughs> he's well known for that. Um, for helping guide, guiding people to see the Dhamma in their daily life and to change their views for the better. And no different from the Buddha teaching Kondanya and with his first teaching, except for Kondanya you might say was ripe to really see the, the deepest, most profound Dhamma. Ajahn Chah no doubt taught a few people to see the deepest and most profound Dhamma as well, but the majority were ordinary villages in northeast Thailand and some of them could be pretty rough and ready and someone was telling me the other day about one uh, man um, what's his name uh, Nu P, which means uh, Mr. Ghost of a Rat <laughs> I don't know if that's really how his name translates but I, my translation of his name was, he's a villager, a famous villager, Mr. Ghost of a Rat, which is not a very nice name in the first place, I guess, who is considered to be hardcore, kind of gang, what we'd call gangster nowadays, a rough and ready guy. We had a lot of rough views, wrong views, and was feared and not liked by many people because he, you know, he, he did a lot of not very good things in his life. But he came across Ajahn Chah, and Ajahn Chah had a great presence, you know, maybe too, an ability to calm down even the toughest gangster, the most kind of aggressive, unruly, distrustful kind of person. He had a good way with them to talk to them and calm them down. And he was willing, because of his peace and compassion, to teach people, to listen and you know, try and improve their views and understanding. This man was totally against Buddhism and the te Buddhist teachings. When he first met Ajahn Chah, he said, I don't believe in karma, I don't believe there is such a thing as good and evil. You just do what you want and I don't care. And he was very rude, disrespectful, aggressive in the way he approached Ajahn Chah. But Ajahn Chah being an awakened teacher, you know, kind, peaceful, unattached, didn't bother about it the bad behavior of this man who came to see him. I guess he thought perhaps, well, the man's already here. He's come this far. Perhaps he still has something good in him. There's some potential there. So Ajahn Chah 
proceeded to teach him on a number of occasions and question the man's views and you know when the man said I don't believe in karma I don't believe your actions really matter you can do what you want and nothing matters you can do evil there's no such thing as evil so it doesn't really matter if you hurt other people you steal you kill doesn't matter and Ajahn Chah's sort of angle was well it does matter <laughs> things come back on you especially if you do heavy karma like killing and stealing you, know, you very quickly you will be in trouble if not with the authorities you'll be unhappy in yourself and really you'll be both you know, you're going to have trouble with other people you're going to have trouble within yourself and at first the guy didn't believe that he said I don't believe you I don't think it matters I don't think he said if it's true <laughs> then when I die I'm going to become a horrible monster in some kind of ghost realm and demon realm so if it's true I'm going to come back and I'm going to haunt you I'm going to try and kill you from my next life I'm going to try and destroy you <laughs> that's how the guy answered Ajahn Chah Ajahn Chah wasn't phased or put off he just kept saying no no you should really look more carefully get to know your own mind when you have an angry thought or greedy thought that makes you want to steal because this guy was a bit of a, a thief look at what it does to your mind does it make you feel peaceful does it help you in your life are the consequences good for you in body and mind how does it affect you and he kept pushing this line until eventually the man started to change his behavior of course when someone changes their wrong views from you know hating the world and taking their anger and stress out on other people and themselves maybe drinking being you know, doing acts of self-harm or harm to others when they start to think about what they're doing more deeply maybe under the influence of a, a good teacher like Ajahn Chah then their behavior starts to improve and all the villages in the area knew this guy as a real troublemaker and they all noticed how when he talked to Ajahn Chah and after that he started to change he's just one example I'm giving because uh, he's sort of memorable but this actually is a story that's repeated in many on many occasions and some of the local villages to where Ajahn Chah lived were originally you know, places that were very unruly unsafe some wild behavior but <clears throat> over the years the decades of hearing teachings from Ajahn Chah seeing the monks having the opportunity to make merit offer offer arms listen to the Dhamma think more about the Dhamma then people changed and whole villages start to, to improve and that's not a small thing because you know, it's in an, er an era when uh, there wasn't so much local government police and that weren't around so for villages that were very um, unruly aggressive to change you know, people got to hear about that and they could direct it back to Ajahn Chah so there's many oppor uh, many stories like that of the way the Dhamma can change someone's views and probably you have your own stories your own life of how hearing the Dhamma in one way or another studying it reading it starts to give you a new outlook new attitude on life for the better I hope <laughs> um, and it gives you something reliable so maybe a word I've found applies to the Dhamma in the inner world of change and uncertainty you know the Dhamma is reliable it doesn't let you down does it because it's the truth what lets us down is our own views and opinions that we get caught up into our own sense of self our own preferences our own desires that often lead us into trouble or get us disappointed unhappy or lead us into conflict with others or whatever the Dhamma doesn't do that the Dhamma is very reliable the Buddha is very reliable which is why we call them refugees so I always, I always found Lumpur Cha and his teachings and the effect he had on Sangha and laity you know, very reminiscent of what I understood the Buddha to be you know, Ajahn Chah was a very good example of a disciple or a student of the Buddha in this day and age um, and he really changed people for the better really had a good effect on them 
And of course, over time, as you know, people like myself and many others from overseas got to hear of Ajahn Chah and went to live and study with him and practice with him too, um, without being forced to do that. Uh, somebody said today, my recollections of living in Northeast Thailand 40 years ago when I first went sound like living in a prison camp. <laughs> I guess externally the conditions sometimes could be pretty simple and tough. You know, not so much food sometimes, although normally it wasn't a problem. Um, no electricity in the beginning, no running water, quite a lot of disease, or at least disease around. Uh, and not many, not many comforts, so you know a little bit like people's ideas of a prison camp. But of course, it wasn't like a prison camp because you're there because, out of faith, out of joy. So I was actually very happy to be there in the forest practicing with Ajahn Chah, even though the conditions could be tough sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. That didn't matter because I had joy. And that's the important thing about Buddha Dhamma is that you know, it brings you joy when you come back to the Dhamma and the Buddha. And when you lose the Buddha Dhamma, <laughs> or as, in Cha, as Ajahn Chah would say, when you abandon the Buddha, that joy goes as well. You've, and you might not realize it because the reason we abandon the Buddha is because we forget and we get deluded. But when you come back to the Buddha, it's like, ah, oh, there's that joy. It's like when people do come and they say, oh, I've been practicing meditation, my meditation is getting nowhere, my practice is not improving, I'm giving up on the Dhamma and going back, you know, to more worldly pursuits. I always say, well, try and remember whatever that it was that inspired you in the beginning. The Buddha's teachings, meeting, wise, compassionate teachers, maybe, and whatever joy you had, try to go back to that as a starting point. We have to, often have to do that. We have to go back. That's why we call it a refuge. You know, a refuge is like your safe home, your safe place. And you have to go back to your refuge over and over again. It's not something you just say, oh, I've got a refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, but then forget all about it. <laughs> That's not really using a refuge, is it? You have to go <coughs> back to your refuge, maybe even every day or even every moment of every day if you're really practicing. Ajahn Chah used to say, you know, is your mind with Buddha, this quality of knowing? You know, you may use the breath as your meditation object or other techniques of vipassana or, you know, there's many meditation techniques, but what he means is are you with the quality of knowing, which is what we're aiming for, in knowing yourself from moment to moment. That's the Buddha, the Dhamma. That's the refuge. Are you with Buddha or not? Or if you have been lost in the world for a while, you know, something traumatic or has happened in your life or you've maybe you've just been enjoying yourself so much you forget all about Buddhism, perhaps, <laughs> and you're trying to get back to Buddhism and the Buddha, the Dhamma. That's the teaching. Are you with Buddha or not? When you're with Buddha, your mind tends to be at ease, feels better. You may still have problems in your life, but when you approach it from a place of Buddha with the knowing, then you are coming from a place of truth, calm, stillness. And the more you're with the mind of Buddha, the mind of the knowing, or this mind of stillness, the better placed you are to meet with the various problems or to separate yourself off from the distractions too. A lot of our problems nowadays are coming from, <coughs> we have so much. You know, as I said, when I began practicing in Thailand, we didn't have a lot in terms of material comfort, but now we do, even in monasteries. You, know, you have plenty of food and nowadays we have internet and we have all kinds of um, material wealth, even in monasteries and in the lay life even more so. You're earning money and buying things all the time. So one of the problems there is we're distracted easily. 
we're not with the knowing or the mind of Buddha, we're with our phone or our computer or we're going here, going there and we're always thinking about buying things and we're always thinking about our jobs and what tasks we have to do and how we have to get on, get ahead in our job and make more money and get on <laughs> because there's so much we can do in this world and we can all travel now, and we can buy things and there's always something to be doing to distract yourself from the present moment and from this body and this mind. Maybe that's the modern, modern challenge or obstacle we face, you know, more than in the old days, the time of the Buddha, where maybe the problem was just making ends meet and making sure you had enough food. Nowadays it's, you know, what to do with so much distraction, so much around, that from day to day, you know, you can be with Buddha for <laughs> a minute, if that, the mind of Buddha, and you can be with all this distraction, whether it's work, entertainment, social things, 99.99% you know, .99 of the time. I think Ajahn Chah might say something like, we're, we're eating up our old merit most of the time. Meaning, you know, all of this comfort and convenience and distraction has come about through causes as well. We're comfortable because we've made merit, we've made good karma that we have enough to eat and we have money to buy things and have all this technology and all these good things around us to distract us. You know, that's partly it's the result of good karma, or we say merit. But are we making more merit is the question. Are we making more good karma? Are we continuing our practice? Because merit runs out, doesn't it? Good karma and its results, its fruits runs out. Good opportunities disappear. How is our life progressing? Like our good health, how long will that last? Health is also seen in terms of merit. You know, while you have good health, you can practice the Dhamma, you can do good, you can further your practice, you have merit. When you get very old or very sick or weak, your merit is running out. When you die, it's gone. <laughs> so while you have merit, are you making more merit or are you just using up what you have already? You know, as we use technology, and we all know you can you know, listen to this talk, you're hearing this talk now, good, that's a great thing. That's, and it's your merit that you have the means to hear the Dhamma, even online like this. But, you know, in the course of a day, probably the majority of the time you're not listening to the Dhamma, you're not using the technology for such uh, useful, beneficial things, I would imagine. I mean, partly we use it for work, of course, you have to earn a living and that is useful, but a lot of the time it's just for more trivial things, distraction, triviality, and so on. If we're honest, that, that tends to be the the norm now. That's the danger. Now, rather than having to struggle with the difficult, harsh conditions, we're having to deal or navigate a way through conditions that encourage indulgence and distraction. How to keep focused on the mind of Buddha when you can spend all your day scrolling on your phone or all evening or all morning. You know, some people, they wake up, first thing they do is just lie there scrolling. <laughs> or, you know, even in the old days, like when I was a kid, when you woke up, you know, you might go and turn on the TV if it was a day that you didn't have to do anything else, like a weekend. That, even that takes an effort, you have to get up and go and turn on the TV. I guess if you got a remote, you could turn it on from the remote. Nowadays, you don't even have to get out of bed, do you? you got a phone, you just lie there, scroll, 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 maybe for half an hour or an hour before you even get out of bed. <laughs> you could be scrolling the Dhamma, I guess, but there's a accompanying dangers, you could be you know, doing damage to your back or various you know, posture problems arise from the endlessly lying in bed scrolling. And of course, what's it doing to your mind? You're not with the mind of Buddha, or you're just with whatever you're scrolling. And a lot of it is not very wholesome, is it? News is often very disturbing and frightening, disappointing, worrying. 
Um, there's a lot of sensuality, you know, even the, the most ordinary advert can be very sensual. Um, a lot of entertainment, of course, and again, just distraction. That's probably more of a, a, a challenge now than just the basics of getting food and getting the, the simple comforts of life, isn't it? We have everything, and so the mind is going to sleep all the time, using up old merit, but not necessarily developing new merit. So this is why teachers like Ajahn Chah and, and why the Dhamma is still so relevant today as it was two and a half thousand years ago. You know, we still have this wandering mind that needs to be trained. We still need to learn the Dhamma and bring it into our, our life. We still need to find some inner peace and joy to deal with the challenges, the stresses, because we're bombarded by so much uh, material comfort, information and with information material comfort comes sense in what we call sense impressions through our eyes and our ears particularly and somewhat to some extent you know nose mouth taste touch but particularly through eyes and ears <coughs> we're bombarded by sense impressions now and you can spend your whole time just with that whether it's through, through work uh, or social life, entertainment, or just mindless distraction. <laughs> That's the reality, I think, for most people. And this is far away from the mind of Buddha. We really need to get some discipline and come back to the Dhamma, the basic Dhamma practices, say, of regular meditation to bring up the mind of Buddha, to be with the breath, to be with the recitation of Buddha, to bring the mindfulness up, to set aside time for that, to be able to put the phone down, put, turn the computer off, to set aside some of these more worldly pursuits because time is running out. We all get older every day and one day we won't have the chance to hear the Dhamma, meditate, practice the Dhamma. One day we'll be you know, lying in bed and say, oh, I should do some more meditation, I should be more mindful, but we won't even be able to get out of bed. And that's how it is. When you get old, you get so weak, so sick, maybe you can't get out of your seat or get out of your bed. While you haven't reached that point, I would suggest use your time to practice the Dhamma. Because there's so much we have to investigate, you know, really investigate why do I get stressed? Why do I get angry, why do I get worried, why do I fear things, why do I, get, why do I follow the endless distractions and the temptations of the world. All of this is, you know, the Buddha has already given us the answers to all these questions. His, his answer would be, well, through lack of knowing, the lack of Buddha, the lack of mindfulness and awareness, we keep following craving. Craving it's desire, you know, desire to get and desire to get rid of. These unmindful, unaware reactions we have to everything, to all these sense impressions. As long as we don't practice, we don't really see what's going on. We don't really know what's going on. So the mind keeps racing, following craving. And it's not peaceful, is it? Craving leads to movement, leads to the mind endlessly thinking, creating, following different trains of thought, getting caught into different moods. And it's not peaceful. Whereas the mind of Buddha, the mind of the knowing, this quality of knowing, is the opposite. You're learning to set aside craving, come back to the knowing, coming back to the stillness. You know, even if craving arises, simply not picking it up, not following it, setting it aside and staying with the stillness more, changes your whole outlook on life, changes the way your mind works. You become more aware of the stillness of the mind rather than following the objects of craving and the movements of mind that come from craving. There's a to total difference there. But we have to give ourselves a chance. You know, if you don't practice, you don't do some meditation, you don't learn how to meditate and then put it into effort, practice on a daily basis. So you're never really going to know this. And you might just be stuck with your beliefs, like like uh, 
Mr. Ghost of a Rat, you know, just think, oh, karma, no, it's not true. Merit, no, not true. Good and evil, no, not true. Never think about keeping precepts, practicing mindfulness, never think about respecting the Dhamma. That's how we, we, we stay on that level as long as we haven't actually put our effort into becoming more mindful and sampling or tasting the, the mind of Dhamma where, mindful, where we have mindfulness and where the mind is still, we're never going to know. We won't be curious and we won't even try perhaps. That's why it's, you know, what is the most useful thing somebody can do for you is to help you to get you to see your own mind. And again, Ajahn Chah was really good at that. <laughs> really good at getting people to turn around and see their own mind. Often by doing very little, simply putting them in a situation where they had to see their own mind. Where, you know, they had to wait. A classic one is getting people to wait. They want to talk, but he's not talking to them. He's, he's being silent when somebody wants to engage in conversation. So they have to wait and watch the desire to speak. And if you watch that desire to speak in a situation, you know, your mindfulness comes up, you realize, well, maybe you need to say something, but maybe you don't. And you just see the desire in that moment, however you're feeling, whatever's stimulating the desire to speak or the desire to do something. You know, sometimes people wanted to meditate, but he would get them doing something else, chanting or doing some job, some work. Or some people like to work, they didn't like to meditate, so he'd make them meditate. <laughs> Ajahn Chah was very good at getting people to do the very opposite of what their craving was telling them, so that they could see their craving at work and how it was affecting their mind, and give them a chance to, you know, maybe let go of some of the craving, come back to the stillness and realize well, you don't have to follow every desire. You don't have to identify with every thought, every desire in your mind. You can also just watch it arise and pass away. Maybe there's some peace in that stillness. So I would encourage you all today you know, from this talk, I would encourage you all to keep practicing even if you have doubts even if you have resistance you can't be as bad as old uh, mr ghost of a rat you know he was really violently against the dhamma when he started but he managed to pacify his mind and come around to be a student of the buddha so if he can do that i'm sure you can i think you've already got faith in the buddha and you find some joy in the dhamma but you do have to keep practicing you have to do more so that will be my final word to you. You keep, keep up your practice, putting effort into your meditation, keeping the precepts, listening to the Dhamma, practicing kindness in daily life, you know, being patient with the difficulties. And I hope that will bring you more and more peace and understanding that will be of your benefit and the benefit of family and friends. And Namaya Dhamma Kataya Sadhuka Rang Dada Mase Sato 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 Anu Modami Thank you, Lampo, for a wonderful reminder and a beautiful talk today. Um, so we would like to now uh, open the floor up for questions and answers. So uh, brothers and sisters, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Lampo or interact with Lampo, uh, feel free to click on the raise hand button and I invite you to unmute. Um, I think Dawn, Dawn, are you here? Dawn, you had a question earlier. Yes, great. Uh, if it's convenient, Dawn, if you could um, turn on your video, then I could uh, put you on screen as well. Hi, can you hear me well? Uh, I can hear you, yep, I'm well. Thank you very much. I'm um, just wondering uh, if you can please uh, share some wisdom about how to uh, uh, navigate the negative 
negativity in mind all the time, even with the success or failure, just is come is coming all the negative thoughts around you, it's like a spiral. Um, just to sort of a advice you can get, give me. Right. Um, I think that's a question many people will be interested in. Um, I think you answered it a little bit in, in the question. You said, you know, how it spirals out. When we're yep. not particularly aware of ourself, we tend to get lost in our negative thoughts, partly out of habit, you know, the pressure of having thought for something before, you tend to think it again. So it's habit. You might call it a bad mental habit. So we need to develop maybe the opposite as much as we can to bring up more mindfulness. Come back to some of the basic techniques like the breath meditation or any other meditation technique that helps you to be more self-aware. So first of all, you can see the negative thoughts as they're coming up. You may not be able to stop them yet. You know, they're coming up through their own power from karma that you've, you've thought in that way, you're reacting to things from before. But at least once you start to see yourself in the moment, oh, I'm getting caught into this negative way of thinking again, then wisdom comes from there, doesn't it? When you start to notice the suffering of negative thoughts by observing, you know, becoming more mindful, you see that. You say, oh, this, I'm suffering when I think in this way. Does it lead on to anything useful? No, it doesn't. It leads on to more um, unhappiness in myself and often it leads on to maybe unskillful behavior in the way I speak, act, relate to other people as well. It doesn't help me. It doesn't lead on to anything good. So as you establish more mindfulness, even short bursts of mindfulness, you know, for a few moments, you start to see yourself more clearly and that gives you the, the, the wisdom to start letting go. And you say, oh, don't feed it. You know, Ajahn Chah used to say with craving, all kinds of craving, whether it's, you know, desire for things, greed, or desire against things, aversion, you know, you have to stop feeding it like a cat, stray cat. So if your stray cat keeps coming around to your house, you say your kitchen, and you feed it, well, it'll keep returning and it'll move in. And I can speak from experience because <laughs> when I was a layman, this happened to me. You keep feeding animals, they'll move in with you. Craving is like that. If you keep feeding it, keep supporting it, indulging it, following it, letting it sit in your mind, so letting those negative thoughts sit in your mind and indulging them, they'll keep coming back and they'll become part of you, part of your personality. And we may even, you know, sometimes we defend it. We say, oh, I'm always getting angry. I'm the angry one. I'm the negative one. To the point where we just accept it as, you know, just part of who we are or part of our life. Sometimes it's like that, but you don't have to. Mindfulness is a very purifying practice. It may take time and effort, of course, but as you establish more mindful awareness in the present moment, you may sooner or later get a glimpse of, a, of an alternative reality where you know, negative thought arises, but you let it go. You don't have to hold on to it and identify with it. You can know it and say, no, I'm not following this. I'm not going to keep with this. And then you may also introduce something that's not negative bring in the opposite, so something based more in kindness and compassion, change some of the ways you think, change some of the actions and the behavior you, you're engaged in, do things slightly differently. That will come as you establish more awareness and investigate your own negative states of mind. Thank you, Lampo. Uh, Don, I hope that answers your question. Anyone else who's got a question, a burning question? Or anything at all that you want to clarify about your practice? Mm. Don't be shy. <laughs> Um, 
that there was a question here about um, Long Paul. The, the question from Maria, but she's no longer here. But uh, if I may ask the question on her behalf, and hopefully uh, her friends who are here can convey the answer to her. Um, the question is, dear Ajahn Kaliano, how did you deal with losing Ajahn Chao when he passed away? Is there another bit to that question? Uh, the bit to the question is, I know you are a very, very diligent, dedicated and devoted disciple of his. With my utmost respect, Maria. Sorry. Oh. I reluctantly have to leave Zoom early. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, well, as a monk from day one, you're constantly surrounded by this teaching of impermanence and that includes life and death, always reflecting on that, whether in chanting or hearing Dhamma talks uh, or just, you know, we attend funerals and visit the sick and you're kind of surrounded by impermanence and the reflection on impermanence. So that perception becomes very clear. And when I first encountered Ajahn Chai, he was already up, um, about 60, over 60 years old and, and already ill. So I obviously everyone knew he would die at some point and I think most people were surprised he lived as long as he did. Having said that, probably the same with any elderly relative you might have, someone you love or identify with who is sick, even though you know they're going to die because they're ill, they're old maybe, in that, you know, obviously it's different in the case of a young person who dies in a sort of un, unexpected death. But if it's somebody older who's sick, you know they're going to die. So you sort of have time to mentally prepare for that and think about it, which helps. But at the same time, when the moment actually comes, it's still quite an emotional pull on you because a teacher is like a parent and you develop a very strong relationship with your teacher like a parent and of course you know moment to moment you may not always be thinking of your teacher or sometimes you may even get irritated with your teacher like you get irritated with parents because with you know if you're an unenlightened person that happens let's be honest <laughs> um, but Ajahn Chah was very sick so I didn't really get irritated with him but you know there's there's days when you're more um, in a better state of mind than others perhaps so when the final loss comes when he finally dies it still has an emotional tug on you and uh, that's quite powerful i actually strangely enough had a deep vision of him passing away a couple of weeks before he died maybe that's just through my connection with him and through my meditation so I was, um, a couple of weeks before Ajahn Chah died, I was in Ajahn Buddha Dasa's monastery, um, visiting there with Lumpur Samedo and a few other monks. And I was walking meditation up and down at night. You know, we, in the day we talked to Ajahn Buddha Dasa, her teachings, but at night I was at my kuti and I was walking meditation up and down. And suddenly I had this deep um, awareness that Ajahn Chah would be dying very soon and it was like somebody what could you say pull when you pull the plug out of a bath and all the water rushes away with a gurgle it's kind of like that it's like all the energy out of my heart rushed away I actually fell to the ground um, I was so weakened by that because it all happened in a few seconds all my mental energy just disappeared and I just collapsed to the ground because I couldn't stand. I wasn't strong enough to stand. Uh, tears did form in my eyes, but I didn't, you know, wail and sob. I had, did have tears forming in my eyes, but I knew, oh, Jen Chao's going to die soon. This is the time. You know, it's going to be soon. And I just reflected. Well, that's you know, that's the closeness, the uh, the attachment. You could say an attachment 
to the teacher is like that. There's a, a strong emotional attachment. So when the teacher goes, that's like it pulls that with you. So I was reflecting on it, observing that at that time as I was meditating. So when he actually died two weeks later, I was ready for it. It wasn't a surprise, and it was like I'd already had a moment, a few weeks of grief. <laughs> Um, so when the real moment happened, the actual moment happened, it didn't overwhelm me so much. That happened two weeks before. And I was actually, when he died, I was actually in the forest again. Ajahn Samedo was there teaching a retreat with uh, the monks from Wat Nana Chat. And I had been looking after Ajahn Chah previously, but then I went to join this retreat. And we were, I was camping in the forest in this monastery, which is an island monastery, about 75 kilometers away from Ajahn Charles Monastery. Um, so a very beautiful big forest. Um, we were meditating, doing a retreat. Um, the night he passed away, his last night, we knew he was very ill, we knew he had gone into the hospital. Uh, so I meditated the whole night. night. Um, I was actually sitting next to a skeleton. Somebody had brought a dead corpse and left it in the forest in a shallow grave for monks to contemplate. So I was camped next to that the night Ajahn Chah died. I was meditating next to a corpse. And in the morning when I finished my meditation, I was collecting my stuff to go on arms round, which is what we do every morning at dawn. I had the thought, this is the day he's dying, because he died around 5, 5.20 in the morning. Um, I said, I better go out and check what's going on. In those days, there's no phone and there's no internet. So it was only guesswork. <laughs> but I went out and Ajahn Chah, uh, Ajahn Sumedho, Ajahn Puriso, the abbot, were there discussing whether they should go into Ubon or not to see Ajahn Chah because they knew he was very ill. And I said, yeah, 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 go, 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 go. <laughs> And I um, worked hard to convince them that they should go because they were sort of weighing it out because there was no information. And we had a car available. So I said, yeah, go, 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 we've got to go. And so we all went, three of us and a driver went into Ubon and arrived about an hour after Ajahn Chah passed away. Um, so on the day he died, I was actually more um, kind of together and because there's a lot we had that we started to have to do when he died. Uh, I had my kind of emotional upset two weeks before, and that's happened with a few other teachers as well. Um, don't know why, maybe it's just me, I don't know. But that's how it is for me. I seem to get my, my grief over and done with before they die, and then they die. <laughs> Thank you, Lampo. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences. I think we all also have that with people that we're close to and we'll have a, an emotional and spiritual connection with. So that a couple of people here who like to ask a question directly. Um, can I please invite uh, Faye? Um, Faye first before Sister Shonu. Hi, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Hello, Faye. <laughs> hello, I'm Paul. So nice to sort of communicate with you. Um, thank you for sharing um, the Dharma talk and also your experiences. Um, the question I have is, um, so practicing here alone without a community, it sometimes can start to feel kind of dry. And um, I'm going about with my daily practices and it's starting to feel like I'm just checking off the boxes. So as, um, you know, for, I think the, the idea of practicing alone far away from a teacher is not, it's something a lot of monks like yourself would have to go through. So at times like this, what is the right way to wisely reflect or counter? Number one, and Jen Cha would say, be patient, be patient with your situation because that's the situation you're in. So if you're in that situation, just be patient with it, accept it, and try and make the best of it. So if you're in Singapore, well, maybe there are some uh, fellow Dhamma practitioners around, Kalyanamita, 
or in it, wherever you are. I'm not sure where, where you are at the moment, but uh, wherever you are. <laughs> I'm in Perth. Ah, okay. Yeah. Find, find some fellow Dhamma practitioners if you can, and that, that's a start. And then, of course, online helps. And then just make some plans when you're free to go closer to Kalyanamitta teachers, you know, even if it's only for retreats or, or short periods where you can interact with Kalyanamitta. But when you're on your own, you, know, you have to be very patient and maybe you're right. You establish a routine and ticking the boxes is not necessarily a bad thing if, you, if it means you're doing certain skillful things like meditation, offering the dham, uh, offering dana in any way. Like you can nowadays you can offer dana from a distance sometimes, doing different kinds of dana activities or volunteering or whatever. Um, meditating every day. And even if you're with a teacher, you know, you meditate every day. It's not always wow. Sometimes you you also you have struggles, sometimes you're bored, sometimes you're fed up, sometimes you have pain, sometimes stuff comes up internally that makes it difficult. It's not like you always have really amazing, peaceful meditations with deep insights, even if you're living in a monastery or with a teacher, say. You go through a lot of the same things because you are you. you, you where, whether you are at home or you're with a teacher, it doesn't change who you are. So you make the best of your opportunities wherever you are. And if some days it seems a bit dry and flat, well, as Ajahn Shah said, you know, that's a dry, uh, a plain rice day where you meditate and, you know, not much joy, not much insight, you know, going through the motions. That's like a day you just eat some plain rice. And then once in a while you get the, a bit of a boost to your practice, seem to have some extra energy, have some insight, your mind settles down and some, everything falls into place and that's the day you get your, your treat, you get your curry or your dessert, whatever it is. I think really wherever you are, you're going to have to deal with that dynamic. So, of course, Kalyana Mitta are important, but also just having the discipline and the patience and endurance just to keep going wherever you are is a vital thing, I think. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, Lobo. Good to see Hello. you. Um, my question isn't exactly, it's not exactly related to this evening's talk. Um, it's on Metta Bhavana. It's, it, I, I like the practice, I enjoy the practice of Metta Bhavana. And it occurred to me recently that um, with Metta Bhavana, we always start with self, and then after that, we move on to people who are our loved ones. That's normally the sequence. And I was just wondering, wouldn't that reinforce the self-cherishing? Now, when it comes to the loved ones, I find myself doing it uh, more fervently when, say, my children are in some kind of trouble and I want them to get out of trouble. Now, again, that sounds like reinforcing that attachment. How do I reconcile that with them? Uh, true. I mean, you pointed out some of the dangers of meta practice, but like you say, you have to contemplate to see these dangers. So one thing that will come up is because if we, our mind, we still have basic self view and attachment, then as we practice meta, that will come up. So sometimes, uh, because of the self view, we have you know the tendency to wish ourselves well to the point where we spoil, you might say we spoil ourselves. And so we may have a bad habit that we've noticed, but because we're developing meta, we say, mm, never mind. <laughs> In the way we, you know, we might find excuses for some things that we need to uh, improve on or change maybe. Um, that may be one disadvantage where we, we have self-view with mixed with meta and our meta is not 
still not wise enough. So we're we're wishing ourselves well. You know, maybe you you do something that's really wrong or harmful to to another person, for example. But you say, oh, I should forgive myself. When you're feeling guilty or self-critical, critical, oh, I should forgive myself. I should have more matter for myself. So you don't learn from the situation. You prolong it by you know, keeping the bad habit because you've got too much matter or your matter is not yet balanced by wisdom. So we need to contemplate as we practice metta. And that's why the Brahma Viharas really practice together when you get deeply into them. Metta is always backed by upeka, equanimity. It's also backed with or mixed with, supported by karuna, compassion. So say in the case I, I just said, say you notice some bad habit you've got, you know, bad speech pattern or a speech habit or some something you did that you're not very proud of, you, you, you realize was wrong. Your karana says, I've got to change this, otherwise I'm going to keep doing it, I'm going to keep hurting myself, hurting others in some way. Upeka says, yeah, and I have to be honest here. And Metta may say, oh, I should maybe tell someone else this fault of mine, because often when we tell someone, if it's a trusted friend maybe, or a trusted teacher, sometimes you tell them, you become more mindful in the, in the case of personal faults, say. So metta practice with wisdom may lead on to some skillful action. Whereas if it's still just mixed with attachment and you know, sort of what we call self-cherishing, uh, we actually protect ourselves too much or you know, we try and hide our faults or we, we don't want to open up to our, our faults or things that we need to change. And the same can be with others. You know, like you say, when our kids or our loved ones are suffering, of course, we have metta and we want everyone else to have metta for them and we want everything to come together to support them or help them through their crisis or their difficulty. But when our kids or our loved ones do something wrong, the danger of metta is you, you excuse it too easily. Maybe they behave badly and that you don't want to tell them off or explain to them what they've done wrong or point it out because of the metta. We just, oh, never mind. It's We can accept many faults and wrong things in our loved ones because metta is again not backed by or supported by karuna and upeka equanimity so we need to contemplate how to develop metta and what's really beneficial for me really beneficial for others do you think about it the buddha's metta was teaching the path the way out of suffering so sometimes that does mean to reassure people comfort people, make them feel relaxed, happy. Of course, there's that side to it. But at the same time, his meta may be pointing out where they've got wrong views or where they're behaving badly or where they're making a mistake. Like, you know, you may wake up in the morning, meta should be saying, get up and do some meditation. But then another part of meta without the wisdom might be saying, oh, I'm just tired. I need to lie here a bit longer. Well, you can do that every day until you die, but you know, you're not going to see the Dhamma. So, metta has to be used with wisdom and guided by wisdom. So we need to contemplate as well. See where the dangers are, where sometimes we maybe it becomes a bias so that you're always forgiving yourself and forgiving others for something that you should really change. You just forgive and carry on doing the same bad thing or make the same mistake. Uh, sometimes we have to say, no, I'm not going to forgive. I'm going to really uh, change for the better now. I've really got to do something about this. So meta can be, you know, sometimes you make yourself doing something you don't want to do <laughs> or you make somebody you love do something they don't want to do. That can be meta as well. So, you know, with a kid, your child... If they're young, you, they have to do homework and they say, I want to play. And the meta says, oh, let him play or let her play, let her do her thing. But another part of meta with wisdom says, no, 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 they need to do this work. You know, I have to be firm. So sometimes meta has to be firm. Sometimes with ourselves, you know, maybe we're eating too much of the wrong food and getting some health problems. So meta would say, don't eat that food. <laughs> Whereas another voice in the mind is saying, I want that food, that's my favorite food, I like it. You know, 
Metta has many sides to it when it's practiced with wisdom. So we also need to re contemplate and reflect how to develop metta skillfully for the ending of our craving and attachment. That's the real purpose of metta. Thank you, Lumpur. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I suppose we have time for one last question. Um, Rafa, oh, Jonathan. Jonathan, if you can unmute yourself. Jonathan, can you unmute yourself? Great, thank you. Greetings, Longpore. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I was I was thinking um, and reflecting while you were talking about scrolling, um, and I was curious. Um, you know, I was thinking about how sometimes when I go out to read news, um, there's sometimes I'm disappointed when there's no news, or on some in some occasions, I'm pleased. Oh, there's a lot going on today in the world, or uh, I'll, I'll come back later and see if anything else has happened. <laughs> um, how how um, how how can we be more skillful in how we read the news? How can we instead of doing what I typically do and maybe other people do? How can we be more skillful and make it a more wholesome part of our practice? Thank you, Longpore. Well, one thing you've kind of pointed out in your question it. News, even news nowadays is a product that we consume and the, the aim of people who produce news, whether it's you know, online or not many newspapers anymore, but online, they're trying to sell their products, so make it tasty, make it enjoyable, make it interesting. Um, so even news producers are trying to find new news that is stimulating, that's part of their job. Uh, if you talk to them, talk to journalists and people, you know, that, that's what they're looking for is the next bit of news. And like you say, it can be addictive. Even bad news and horrible news and sad news can be addictive because it's something that just grabs our attention. So in the long run, our aim is to balance that up a bit and find other things that are more fulfilling in our mind that mean we don't have to seek out news in that way just just for stuff to stimulate us or seeking the attention uh, or stimulate our attention try and find things that will fulfill us from the inside you know from the point of view of dhamma so like somebody who comes to our monastery the other day they were saying they did an experiment they did a seven days news fast you know, mostly we say fasting is about food or something, but they did a seven days news fast just to see what it's like because they notice the same thing. They're always addicted to finding out what the latest news is, what's the story, what's the details, and you know, it's endless, like you say. So they cut it off for a week and they realize, oh, you can stay fine without hearing the news, even when there's wars and problems and economic problems and crises everywhere. You don't hear the news for a week, you're still alive. <laughs> your life is still going on. It's not the end of your world. You know, things may be happening in, in other people's worlds, but your world is still much the same. And you can come back to the news or you could do another seven days maybe. This is what he found out. It really isn't that important to have, keep up with every little development and detail. And I guess that's what you're aiming for, is to be in that place where you have a choice, where, sure, sometimes it's useful to know the details of some new stories, just basic understanding of the world. But the majority of them are not that impacting on us at the moment, maybe. So, you know, you don't really need to examine them in that detail, and not as often as we tend to do. But also to realize that you know you can choose and if you choose not to follow the news or read up on the news that's fine as well and practice of mindfulness meditation and then reflecting on things gives you some of that choice it's the same with entertainments the same with everything that we become addicted to and stimulated by what you're aiming for is to have enough choice where you can see well is this useful for me helpful to me or not 
And if it's not, well, okay, I don't, you can discard something or at least temporarily discard it. Sometimes pick it up, sometimes put it down. But the idea is not to be a slave or addicted to things. That's your aim. When you're mindful, you're not addicted. When you're not mindful, you're just following habits, cravings, attachments. And that just leads to more delusion, more habits, more addiction, more attachment, which is not good. It leads to more suffering. Mindfulness is going in the other way. You start to establish more mindfulness, then your reflective power improves. You feel like you know, you've got more freedom to pick up the new story or put it down at your, you know, there's some, you have something higher there or better. So it's not really that news is good or bad, it's more you are gaining more control of your mind and more seeing what really supports your practice and you might say your peace of mind as well. Um, so some people decide I really don't need a lot of news because they find it very disturbing. Sometimes people get very worried, frightened by it, sad by it, saddened by it. So you, you're getting more control of your life and seeing what really supports you, what you need and what you don't need, rather than just following habit and craving. Does that make sense? Yes, Longport. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, everyone. Um, I think that's the time that we all we have for this evening. It's pretty late uh, in Melbourne in the monastery, uh, and uh, we shall now move on to the next segment which we will share the Buddha's words on loving kindness, as well as the verses on sharing and aspiration. Uh, could we please invite Long Pa to lead us in those reflections, the chants as well? Oh, uh, so the Buddha's words on loving kindness, do we recite this as a chant? Uh, uh, a bit out of practice with your, your what you're doing on your, your Zoom sessions? Yes, uh, we will. Uh, you you would will, you will chant it in English and then we'll all follow. Okay. Can I remember them? I think I can remember. So loving kindness first. And then versus on sharing and aspiration. I'll put them up on screen on Paul. Okay. Are you able to see it? I can see it. So I will chant as we do in the monastery here. Hopefully you can all follow along. Now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Let none, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings radiating kindness over the entire world, 
spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Next chant, next verse. Now let us chant the verses of sharing and aspiration through the goodness that arises from my practice. May my spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, my mother, my father and my relatives, the sun and the moon and all virtuous leaders of the world May the highest gods and evil forces, celestial beings, guardian spirits of the earth, and the Lord of death, may those who are friendly, indifferent or hostile, may all beings receive the blessings of my life. May they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless, through the goodness that arises from my practice and through this act of sharing, may all desires and attachments quickly cease and all harmful states of mind until I realize Nibbana in every kind of birth. May I have an upright mind with mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor. May the forces of delusion not take hold, nor weaken my resolve. The Buddha is my excellent refuge. Unsurpassed is the protection of the Dhamma. The solitary Buddha is my noble guide. The Sangha is my supreme support. Through the supreme power of all these, may darkness and delusion be dispelled. Thank you so much, Longpo. We shall now close the session by expressing our gratitude to Longpo. Brother Darren will lead us in the closing homage. <laughs> Araham Samma Sambuddho Apagawa Uddham Pagawantang Apiwa Devi Sawakato Apagawata Tammo Tammang Namasami Supati Pando Apagawato Sawakasanko Sankang Damati Thank you so much, Lung Paul. Blessings to you all. Good good night and uh, may you all flourish in the Dhamma and find happiness. And uh, blessings to you and everyone and all the Sangha at the monastery. Uh, may you all have a peaceful, smooth and wonderful Vasa this season. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.